Hey, Ralph, how are you doing? Good, Randy. How are you? Good, good. thought we'd have a little bit of a conversation here today around some of the most recent developments that are going on in Washington, D.C., and some things we think may be coming down the road in the very near future as it relates to COVID-19 and the impact it's going to have on our members. So one of the more interesting and, and most recent developments is around what's happening in the VA, uh, Ralph. And, and so what my understanding is recently there was a memo uh, that was released by Dr. Stone, who's the executive in charge at the VA. And, and there's also a directive that was released at about the same time, Directive 1899. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on there and, and, and what do you think that means for CRNAs? Yeah, so uh, Directive 1899, we, we've, uh, we had, had a good idea that it was coming for, for quite some time now. Um, and it was specifically relating to um, uh, federal supremacy as far as working across state lines. Uh, it is something that the, the VA has the, had the authority to do, but had never formalized it. And um, this uh, directive um, formalizes the ability of practitioners to work across state lines and talks a lot about working to the top of their, their uh, education, training, and skill, full scope of practice. Um, and the associated memo from Dr. Stone uh, specifically encourages facilities to change their bylaws uh, to recognize the full practice authority of CRNAs. Uh, we think this is a, a really positive step forward, um, building to you know, what, what we're gonna be pushing for, which is uh, the, the full practice authority to be permanent for CRNAs uh, across the VA healthcare delivery system. So we're, we're really uh, encouraged by the steps taken by the secretary uh, and the chief executive in charge, uh, Dr. Stone, and, and we'll continue to push uh, to try to make that uh, formalized uh, full practice authority and, and make it permanent. Right, and, and as we know, the VA is the, the largest healthcare provider in the United States and, and is experiencing quite a bit of strain related to COVID-19. But we also know uh, before COVID-19, there have been issues with access to care by veterans, to surgical care, and the limitations of anesthesia. Can you address that briefly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, you know, the, the VA has, has obviously has had some challenges in the past. And um, in the rulemaking that, that uh, granted full practice authority to the other three APRM provider types, um, it talked about uh, the rationale for leaving uh, CRNAs out of that rulemaking. And they, you know, in their rule, they stated specifically CRNAs are, it's not a question of safety. Um, it is because there is no uh, access issues related to shortages in anesthesia. Um, and this, since that rulemaking has proven to be anything but true. You know, there have been numerous instances uh, numerous reports. I think the, the the biggest one was an inspector general's report that came out um, over a year ago, uh, but it was looking at uh, access issues, and it found that anesthesia was uh, one of the reasons why veterans weren't getting access to timely, uh, most timely, high quality healthcare. Um, and we've seen it, you know, in the scandals in in the Denver VA facility. One of the more glaring uh, examples, you know, they were canceled or postponed 90 cases in a three month period, and it was due to directly related to a lack of anesthesia services. Um, and they were operating at a one-to-one -one and two-to-one supervision model, which as we know is uh, the most inefficient and frankly the most ridiculous way to provide anesthesia. Um, so that, you know, it's, it's become apparent over time that, that anesthesia is, is causing access issues and the, the full utilization of CRNAs is gonna be an, the easiest answer to that issue. Uh, and the most cost-effective way is to, is to grant full practice authority. And I think the VA is coming to that conclusion uh, with a little bit of help from us. Yeah, so not everybody's in love with the idea of improving access to care by providing full practice authority to APRMs and nurse anesthetists in, in particular. We know that uh, as recently as just a couple of days ago, there was a, a, a email that was sent from the president of the ASA to members, to their members, describing this as somehow a threat to patient safety or veteran patient safety within the VA. And then they launched some grassroots lobbying. What, what's that about? Yeah, you know, it, for those of you who have seen the letter, it was, um, you know, a little bit ridiculous, you know, the, 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 and, and frustrating and, and ridiculous, not capture um, what I'm feeling when, when I read that letter. 
because it questions the the safety and and uh, uses tired scare tactics to say full practice authority for CRNAs equals uh, veterans being put at risk. And we all know that there is no science-driven evidence-based uh, reason to feel that way. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's frustrating. You know that that is still the tactics that they're choosing to use when we're facing this crisis. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's uh, really troubling. Um, but it, they have a loud voice and they are uh, engaging on this in a big way. You know, since they put out that letter and called for action, uh, they've had over 16,000 uh, of their members uh, send letters to Congress, um, urging their members of Congress to contact the VA and, and express concerns uh, with CRNAs being granted full practice authority. Um, and that's a big number in a very short amount of time. Um, I, we've got a, a very good grassroots uh, letter um, out to our members as well. Um, as of this morning, we had uh, just about 2,000 uh, CRNAs that take, had taken action. Um, so we really need to, to ramp that up um, and, and make sure that we're making our voice heard as well, because 16,000 um, doctors reaching out to their members of Congress, if members of Congress then doesn't hear the other side and they don't see the other, the, the science, uh, the evidence and economics of our arguments, you know, they, they might, they might reach out to the VA and, uh, put the full practice authority of CRNAs in jeopardy. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about our response to that. What are we asking from our members? So we're asking, we're asking our members to contact members of Congress, um, to, uh, express our support for the, uh, recommendations of the, uh, chief executive in charge, Dr. Stone, uh, and secretary Wilkie. And to contact them to say, you know, that, that we support um, full practice authority for CRNAs uh, during this emergency, but also making it permanent because it is the right policy at the right time um, to improve uh, veterans access to the highest quality uh, anesthesia care across the country. Yeah, it's interesting to watch this on, on unfold, you know, as you know, I have my, my CRNA slash CEO head of the ANA on. I also think about it as a veteran, right? And uh, yeah, I was going to I was going to ask you that how you felt <laughs> as a as a veteran reading all this right. stuff. It, it, it's perplexing when when you, when you think about this. You know, it, look, you know, when I was in in the military and uh, I provided anesthesia care through the Department of Defense or the United States Army, you know, in in uh, Afghanistan, right? And I was in forward surgical teams, and and I I didn't really observe or was aware of any anyone signing up to supervise me uh, when I was in a hostile uh, environment. Uh, and you come back to the United States, and it's interesting. I also provided anesthesia care unsupervised, uh, full practice of authority, uh, and uh, in military hospitals in this country. And you could walk across the street from a military hospital to a VA hospital, and all of a sudden, you have to be supervised. And you think about you know, the impact that that has on the access to, to care. And as a veteran, it makes me angry to be perfectly candid with you, and because we know we have data, we have hard data that indicates that veterans are having their procedures and their surgeries postponed uh, because of inadequate, quote unquote, access to anesthesia care. And it doesn't make any sense at all. And you look at the, the massive inefficiency that exists uh, because of that, and it's, it really is a shame that we are playing politics with the care of the people who put their lives on the line uh, for this country. You know, my brothers and my sisters are the ones who are in the VA. And I think it's appalling, to be perfectly candid with you. And so, We'll continue to work at that and supporting our veterans and, and, and moving in the right direction. Yeah. So let's and, talk and about, go ahead. And go I ahead. just, I just wanted to add one thing just because, you know, it, it, it just made me think about the inefficiencies and, and what that actually means. I mean, in the Denver facility, um, when, when you think about what happened, the postponements, um, they had an adequate anesthesia workforce if everyone was providing anesthesia, but they were using one to one, two to one. And when they, this crisis came to light, what was their response? They didn't ease these ridiculous supervision requirements. They hired four more anesthesiologists at $1.6 million annually. And I dug in and did a little bit of research about 
you know, the salaries of, of social workers, of psychologists, of uh, suicide prevention hotline operators, all the other things that that $1.6 million could have been used for to benefit our veterans. And if you extrapolate that across the country, I mean, there, there's so much better use, so many other things that, that those funds could be used for to take care of our veterans. And, and you, you know, you serve this country. You deserve um, to, to have access to the care that you need. And wasting millions of dollars on models that there's no evidence out there that supports them is just absurd. And, you know, we're going to do our best to make sure that everyone hears that uh, and knows uh, th that we provide the highest quality care and we're the answer to, to veterans access. Yes, amen. I'll, I'll make one more comment and, and then we'll, we'll move to another topic here is, you know, we are seeing some of the, the letters that are going into Congress from our physician anesthesiologist colleagues. And, and I've had people reach out to me and say, well, why do I care about full practice authority in the VA? You know, I'm a CRNA. I, I'm not a veteran. Uh, I'm never going to work in the VA. Well, why would I care? And, and the question and the answer to, I would say is, well, are you comfortable with being classified or characterized as a mid-level provider? that would jeopardize veterans' lives if you were able to practice to the full scope of your education and training. If you're okay with that, stay on the sidelines. But if you're not okay with that, join us on this call to action and get involved, put some skin in the game, because that's precisely what's happening right now. So let's, let's switch topics here, because there is so much to go on and, uh, going on right now, and I, and I, I wanna make sure that we cover the hot, the hot topics. So yeah. today, uh, President Trump is undoubtedly going to sign some new funding, uh, which uh, passed uh, the Senate on Monday and the House of Representatives yesterday. And tell me a little bit about what that is and what that isn't and what it means for us and our members. Yeah, so uh, Congress just uh, put forth what they're calling uh, CARES 2.5. So it is not um, a, a new package. Um, it is a plus up of the funding that was um, authorized, the programs that were authorized under the initial CARES package, which is also known as COVID-3. Um, so um, this plus up funding was for the payroll protection program and some other uh, access for, for uh, facilities, hospitals, et cetera. Um, you know, there, there are some benefits in there for, for CRNAs. If uh, they're 1099s, uh, they would have access to, to some portion of the funding. Um, it does, however, uh, continue to leave out a big portion of, of our membership, you know, in, in the form of the W-2s. Um, so uh, it's, it's, more of a, it's more funding for the program that, that we already saw. Um, and, you know, it it's, continues to have some problems that we're working really hard to address. You know, we've been uh, working at, with HHS and members of Congress on two fronts to try to make sure that uh, every CRNA, uh, regardless of their employment type, um, has access to some funding to remain whole uh, throughout uh, throughout this crisis. So we'll continue to work inside HHS for, for the funding um, that hasn't yet been allocated from the initial uh, package and that just got plussed up uh, because there is some wiggle room in HHS to, to change um, how they're distributing the funds. So we're working hard inside uh, the agency and uh, we're also working hard in Congress for the next COVID package because uh, that's probably on the way uh, here in, in, in short order, um, I, I'm, I'm hearing uh, they're, they're already working on it. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that, that we're working to, to advance the interests of our, of our members uh, through, you know, through that next package as it comes together. Yeah, and you think about this. So we've been in, in the midst of this crisis in the United States, at least for what, five, maybe six weeks. And we've already spent something like three trillion with the T uh, or fixing to spend three trillion dollars in stimulus uh, and that's all happened all of those decisions that's made it through Congress been signed or will be signed by the president in about a five-week period and that's just astonishing when you when you think about how much money is is being allocated and, and sometimes it's not being allocated the most effective and efficient way uh, that's my soapbox and, and clearly we're seeing that as it's uh, maybe not making its way to providers who are being harm, financially harmed by this, as well as uh, rural hospitals and other facilities. So we, we talk about what, you know, what would CARES Act 2.0 look like uh, and how it could potentially impact CRNAs. What, what do you think 
our key advocacy objectives are in, with Congress right now and with HHS, primarily through that second st major stimulus package. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we are, we're focused, obviously, personal protective equipment is, is something that we continue to work very hard for. You know, we want to make sure that uh, there's enough funding, uh, enough availability for uh, the equipment that's going to keep the frontline providers safe. You know, we, we, that's imperative, obviously. So we're going to be pushing for that. Um, but, you know, as, as healthcare providers and, you know, the folks who are going to need to be around uh, to, to one battle this crisis, but to help us come out of this crisis, we need to make sure that our healthcare workforce is, is taken care of. So, you know, a big portion of, of what we're doing as far as advocacy is, is trying to find ways that we can um, give healthcare providers who have either become unemployed or underemployed um, due to this crisis, uh, the ability to remain financially whole. So we're, we're currently pushing for, um, uh, it's a proposal that, that, uh, was introduced by Senators Bennett from Colorado and Barrasso from uh, Wyoming. Um, and it's a proposal aimed at helping rural, rural facilities, um, which we also support. Um, but it included a provision for uh, grants to be um, made available to healthcare providers specifically. And we are really supportive of that idea. Um, the only, with a tweak, you know, and, and this is what we're pushing for right now. So the Bennett Barrasso proposal um, includes a grant program, but it capitates the uh, annual salary at 75000 And for many healthcare providers who are affected by that, that is not, uh, from our perspective, adequate. So we're pushing with members of Congress to move forward with the, the concept of that grant funding, um, but to change the annual salary allocation to 90% of uh, the healthcare provider's salary when their employment was uh, interrupted. So if they became unemployed or underemployed, whatever their salary was at, at that time, they would have, have access to grant funding that would um, equal that at, at 90% of that level. So that's, that's kind of where we're, we're laser focused right now. Um, you know, and we're, we're obviously working on some other things, uh, including full practice and supervision removal. But in the next uh, CARES package, it's, it's going to be helping our guys remain financially whole uh, throughout the crisis. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, Ralph. So I'll, I'll conclude just with a, a couple plugs and, and start with, you know, this evening at 5 p.m., uh, we're having a, a webinar on self-care and wellness and resilience. And, and I know uh, many of you are feeling the stress of this situation. And, and we're also cognizant of the fact that despite what we want, uh, this, is a, this, this crisis is going to be going on for a while. And that, that cumulative stress can have a really negative impact on you. So Please join us if you're if interested in available at 5 p.m. tonight for our peer support webinar. Uh, for our student colleagues, the SRNAs who are listening, uh, if you haven't signed up, we highly recommend that you sign up for a SRNA town hall uh, on Monday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, where we'll be answering your questions, uh, and we know that you have a lot. So please, please join us there. Uh, two more plugs. So another thing that we're obviously very focused on is the impact of this crisis on the availability of drugs that nurse anesthetists use in the clinical environment. So we'll be having a, a webinar next uh, Tuesday, April 28th at 5 p.m. on drug shortages. And then finally, back to our students, uh, we know obviously student loans and the financial impact of this crisis is weighing heavy on you. So uh, we will have a student loan repayment during uncertain times webinar on Wednesday of next week, April 29th, at 12 p.m. So until then, uh, we uh, look forward to hearing from you and supporting you moving forward. Have a great day and have a great weekend. Thanks.